Aloha Kakahiaka. Happy Aloha Friday, everyone. And a very warm welcome to all of you and all of our participants who are essential for this webinar. Without you, we wouldn't be able to have a webinar. So participants are absolutely essential um, for our webinar. And we're grateful for your valuable time. Time is such a precious commodity. Um, so we appreciate your time to join us this morning. This is the fifth of six webinars that introduce and share highlights of the 2022 statistical report for the Hawaii State Plan for a data-driven system of care. That's a mouthful, okay? System of care on substance use. This webinar will be focused on two chapters. Chapter eight focused on the intersection of substance use and family violence, as well as chapter 12, which is the intersection of substance use and pregnant and parenting women. My name is Victoria Fan, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Before we get started with our presentation, just a few housekeeping reminders. This is a Zoom webinar event, which means that you, our audience, are able to see us, the panelists and the presenters, but we cannot see you. Um, so there are two ways for you to interact with us uh, and also between yourselves as well. We encourage you to interact with each other. Uh, the first is through the chat window which you should be able to see on the Zoom status bar. And then the second is through the questions and answers window, which you should also be able to access through the Zoom status bar. So we encourage you and very much appreciate any questions or comments that you pose. It gives a sense, you know, unlike a live audience where we can see your faces if you're falling asleep, uh, the questions tells us if you're, you know, engaged and interested, or even if you're bored, tell us that you're, just, you know, too, too obvious, also let us know as well. Um, so, and also please take the opportunity to introduce yourselves. That makes it more interactive and adds to our discussion. Anyway, the whole purpose of these webinars is to get your comments and your feedback and ideas. And our panel and team will try to answer your questions as they arise. Uh, we've also al allocated time for discussion so that our panel may try to answer questions at that time. And of course, um, experts are you know, there are so many experts out there. You are also experts as well. And we also very much appreciate your thoughts and guidance as well. Okay, so there will be four uh, poll questions posted throughout the presentation. So get ready for some interaction, find your mouse and clicker. Uh, there will also be a short post webinar survey at the end that will pop up when you leave the Zoom room. And your feedback is very important for us. So we can improve at least the next one. And you know, future webinars, as well as the report in general. So please consider to spend just a minute or two after the webinar ends to fill out the survey. We really do take that feedback very seriously to improve the webinars. Okay, so we will also be providing the slide deck with all of the materials, contact information, links uh, to all of our participants after the webinar, and uh, also a recording of the presentation. And the recordings for the first a uh, few webinars are also available. And again, the link to this webinar, uh, once it's recorded and posted, will be shared with you all. Okay, so now I'll move on to introducing our panel. So our first panelist is John Valera from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Many of you know him already. He is the acting administrator of ADAD. Uh, and in that role, he is the sponsor for the state plan project. He's served at ADAD in various capacities since 2016. He is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners. Uh, he has a master's in urban planning from the University of Hawaii, a bachelor of science in planning and public administration from the University of Southern California. Our second panelist is Dr. Jared Euro, also from the Hawaii Department of Health, uh, ADAD or Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Jared has a doctor of psychology degree from the United States International University. He completed his master's in education at Columbia and received his master's in psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, San Diego. He is a licensed psychologist. Uh, since 20, uh, 2002, he's worked at ADAD where he serves currently as the chief clinical officer, clinical psychologist supervisor, and also acting public health program manager. Okay. Our third panelist is Karen Worthington Esquire, a child welfare law specialist. Uh, she earned her bachelor's of arts in creative writing from Eckerd College and her uh, doctorate in law from Emory University School 
of law. Karen Worthington is based in Maui. She is a subject matter expert and lead author of the System of Care chapter in our state plan project uh, with a focus on family violence. Uh, the, the chapter title is called Intersections Among Family Violence and Substance Use. Okay. Our fourth panelist is Candice Pang, and she has many letters after her name, uh, which perhaps she can tell us what, what those mean. Uh, I think licensed social work and a CSAC and another ACSW. Uh, she's the executive director of the Salvation Army Family Treatment Services. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in public health from the University of Hawaii. Is that, is that not, not correct? Okay, that's an in, incorrect typo. Uh, I apologize for that. I'm glad I caught that. I was like, are you sure? Okay. Candace is a subject matter expert and is an author of the System of Care chapter of the State Plan Project focused on substance use and pregnant and parenting women uh, entitled Implications for a System of Care in Hawaii for Pregnant and Parenting Women and Substance Use. So please welcome our panelists uh, to our webinar. And uh, like our previous webinars, we are pleased that our team members from our research lab, the Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, have also joined us to help present our chapter highlights. Shelby McKee holds a Bachelor of Arts in Public Health, maybe this is where the typo came from, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She's been working at PHAC uh, since her third year in college. We've seen her grow in, in various roles, uh, various projects, the Hawaii Opioid Initiative, the OD2A project, and now the State Plan Project. And for this project, she's been supporting this webinar series, including development of infographic and print materials. Um, and many of you know that workforce development is a key objective of the University of Hawaii. And so we are very grateful to the Department of Health that this project has helped us to train the next generation of public health professionals together. Okay, so again, my name is Victoria Fan, and I'm your facilitator for today. I'm an associate professor at the University of Hawaii. I'm also the director of our research lab, the UH Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, and I'm the principal investigator for the UH side for the state plan for substance use. I was born and raised in Hawaii. I have an eclectic background. I studied engineering and anthropology at MIT, followed by epidemiology, demography, and health economics at Harvard. Anyway, I've been at UH for the last eight years. And I've had a wonderful time working with our students and the Department of Health on various um, health analytics projects. Okay, so now we're moving on into our presentation. So our presentation is separated into two main parts. So first, our panelists will uh, walk you through highlights from chapter eight of the report, uh, which looks at the intersection uh, with family violence, followed by a short discussion. Okay, uh, then uh, Shelby will walk through some of the highlights for chapter 12 of the report, looking at the intersection of pregnant and parenting women, again, followed by a short discussion. And please post any questions you have in the chat for our panelists to answer. And we also encourage you to post your own answers and comments as you discuss these issues as well. So we are aware and appreciate the fact that you are all uh, very much the experts as well. And uh, again, we really, really appreciate and welcome your feedback and perspectives. So we have only an hour for each of our webinars. Uh, the purpose of these webinars is really to introduce and highlight some of the findings from the 2022 report. So if you are interested in viewing the current draft version of the report, a link and password should, be, should have been provided or will soon be provided to you in the chat window. And it's also listed here on the screen and was also emailed to you um, just now. Okay, so there were some issues with copying the links in the chat. So anyway, the email was sent out just now as well. So you have it uh, for your access as well. If you have any difficulty uh, accessing it, please let us know. Uh, this statistical report is a draft. It's in the consultation process. Uh, it's in a view only version. It's not available for download. Alternatively, you can also view the highlights provided in this webinar through the Hawaii Behavioral Health Dashboard, which is available interactively, um, as well as the infographics that are provided, and those links um, have also been provided as well. Okay, we'll move on now to discuss our, uh, on the next slide, I think, has some of our data sources and um, this statistical report. Before we move on to the chapter highlights, I do want to give you just a reminder about the data sources that we used in this report. Uh, we did discuss some of these limitations in previous webinars, but for those of you joining for the first time, it is important that we just briefly share some of the context. Um, there are um, 18 data sources that we used 
for this statistical report. Uh, they fall into three general categories. Uh, some of them have aspects that belong into multiple categories. Each type of data has different pros and cons, and using data across multiple types of data allows us to validate across different sources. And some of the key data sources that we've used include, we call it the NUSDA, which stands for the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the HCUP, which is the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project Hospitalizations Data, as well as the WITS, the Web Infrastructure for Treatment Services. So when you get into data sources, it's all just a bunch of alphabet soup. Uh, they're all listed here in case you need the quick acronyms of what data is what. So these 18 sources uh, were the best available sources that we had at the time when the draft was prepared, uh, uh, finalized in February of this year. Many of these sources are available publicly. And some of these sources were shared with us uh, selectively by partners who gave us access to that data. And that was really important for us. So we are aware there are many other data sources out there, which may be more comprehensive or newer. Uh, but for whatever reason, we don't have access to them at this time or at the time when we were completing this report. And again, those are all very, very much welcome suggestions and feedback about how we might be able to gain access to those other data sets in the future. Importantly, the reproducible analytics framework that was built to produce the report will allow us to make updates to the report in a fairly minimal effort um, as more and newer data every year we collect new data. Uh, as new data becomes available, it should be relatively straightforward to uh, populate the report again. If you would like to learn more about the methodology and the details about the research that was used to produce this report, we encourage you to read through chapter one, which covers a lot of this in greater detail. And if you would like to learn more about some of the limitations of each data set, uh, the appendix in the report also outlines this information for each data set along with the links uh, and their references. So we'll atten attempt to outline some of these as we go through the sources for each chapter. Um, but as you can see, these are three main broad sources, survey, clinical, and administrative. Um, and, and we could have a whole research course just talking about data sources, but we're not gonna do that to you. We won't subject you to that type of pain. And we'll move on now to our chapter um, highlights um, for chapter eight, which is focused on substance use and family violence. And before we do that, we will start with our first poll question, uh, which is, how familiar are you with the substance use issues affecting people who have experienced family violence in the state? And just take a few seconds to just uh, click your responses. Great, thank you very much. It looks like the majority of you are all very familiar and somewhat familiar uh, with these issues. Okay, moving on to our next question. Are you directly involved with providing substance use services to people who have experienced family violence? Great, thank you very much. The majority of you uh, have not been uh, directly providing uh, services. Okay, this is really good to know who our audience is. Okay, uh, moving on. So chapter eight, just an overview. This particular chapter um, uses uh, various data sources, uh, including the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System child maltreatment reports, as well as the child protective services system, child abuse and neglect in Hawaii reports. Uh, this chapter really just has a focus uh, primarily on, on crime and violence. Um, and the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System um, collects data about reports of child abuse and neglect from different child services agencies in all 50 states, okay? And then the CPCSS, a data source is uh, maintained by the Department of Health, I'm sorry, Department of Human Services, which investigates reports of child abuse and neglect. And it serves as a central registry of reported child abuse and neglect cases. Okay, 
So these data presented today are from publicly available data summaries rather than detailed record level data. The main difference between these two data sets are the time periods. The first one summarizes the data by the federal fiscal year, whereas the second one summarizes it by the calendar year. So that is a minor but still important distinction. And of course, all of our chapters have various limitations, but uh, one key limitation is that maltreatment risk factors are quite difficult to assess and measure, and it may go undetected among children and caregivers. Okay, so um, we'll now be passing it over, I believe. Um, oh, we just, I just covered these limitations just here. And uh, moving on to the next slide. So I'll be passing it now over to uh, my colleague, John Valera to uh, share a bit about these um, crime and violence highlights. Thank you, Victoria, for that wonderful introduction. Um, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, so this is, uh, I have a couple slides. It's not my segment today is very long. So um, let's get right into it. So this is from the National Child Abuse and Neglect System, uh, the national data set. Um, it suggests that um, this is the percentage of children who have experienced maltreatment, not by child maltreatment, where basically uh, it's defined in the separate statute, uh, I believe the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act uh, refers to any act or failure on the part of a parent or care, a caretaker, which results in uh, serious physical, emotional harm, death, sexual abuse or exploitation, um, which presents or leads to an imminent risk of harm to serious harm to the child. Um, so this graph talks about the percentage of children who've experienced maltreatment. Um, from 2016 to 2019, I believe this is a, uh, an average of the four years or yes, no, no, it's each year is indicated on the graph. It uh, shows that child abuse, oh, uh, drug abuse was a caregiver risk factor for nearly 50% of the children who experienced maltreatment in the state of Hawaii. Uh, of special note is that compared to the national data, uh, drug abuse as, the, as a caregiver risk factor was 20% higher. So that's the green lines at the top bar graph compared to the bottom one, which is represents the US. So it's higher in Hawaii than the United States. Next slide, please. Now this is from the Hawaii data. So from 2016 to 2020, drug abuse was basically in the top three um, and a precipitating factor for more than 40% of confirmed child victims of abuse or neglect in the state of Hawaii. What's significant that I see here is um, you see the drug abuse, which is that uh, goldenrod line in the, at 40%, but there is that blue line. No, it's a perp, it's a purple line. Okay. So yeah. So the top two are unacceptable child rearing methods and inability to cope with parenting responsibility. All right. Next slide, please. As I said, my this uh, my segment was short. I'll defer back to Victoria. Thank you, John. So we're now at the discussion portion of our presentation. We have about ten minutes or so for discussion. Um, so. At this point, maybe I'll invite uh, Karen or anyone to um, help us answer some of these discussion questions. So as subject matter experts, what are some key highlights on substance use among people who've experienced family violence 
uh, that you would like to share with the audience? Maybe we could start with, um, with Karen. Hey, thanks, Victoria. Um, one thing I just want to clarify is uh, there was the chart that showed Hawaii compared to the rest of the nation in terms of use of substance abuse or um, parental caregiver risk factors associated with child abuse and neglect. And I do want to highlight that that is a would be a clear takeaway from looking at that graph, um, but there are underlying questions about the data that, uh, that are used that would say that that is a hypothesis that we should test before walking away saying, oh my gosh, Hawaii is 20% higher than anywhere else. So a couple of things is um, caregiver risk factors are something about the parent that would put the child at risk immediately or in the future of harm, and they factor into the child welfare system um, decisions about what actions to take, what services to, to offer the family, if any, whether an actual investigation needs to happen. And those caregiver risk factors are assessed at different times. So I should back up and say that all of this data is about children who have been reported to state child abuse and neglect hotlines. And so in some states, the parental risk factors may be gathered at the point of intake. At some time, and other states, they might be gathered by child welfare services investigators who are out working with the family. So there is not consistency on what that means across states. Another thing is that the INCANS data is not mandatory. Um, states, most states report most of the items, but there's no sanctions for not. And so on the parental risk factors, 41 states report the drug abuse. 37, oops, 34 states report alcohol as a risk factor and 37 states report domestic violence as a risk factor. So the percentages that are provided are of those 41 states, of the 34 states and of the 37 states, not of the 50. So if you're doing any comparative analysis, I just wanted to point that out. Um, another reason that it is so hard to understand the prevalence of um, substance use disorders or substance use among this population of children who are um, alleged to be maltreated is uh, how and when that information is gathered and when it might be discovered. Because of course the child welfare services worker doesn't knock on the door and the parent says, oh, you know, I've got, I think I um, have a substance use disorder, I need help. Um, that information is usually uncovered over time. And depending on when it is found out, it may be recorded differently in official data. So thank you. Um, I really want to, I know we're supposed to hear from y'all. So I'm hushing right there and um, we'll turn it back to Victoria or over to Candace. Well, we still have time if there's other comments from Candace or other panelists. Yeah, aloha. This is uh, uh, Dr. Jared Uro this morning. And uh, Karen, you know, and we're looking at this and really, you know, the data and in hearing your discussion, I think one thing that's clear to me is just the importance of providing uh, treatment services for those individuals, really parents and families that are, have been dealing with this as a history. And so we look at all of the factors that are involved in being able to support families. Um, we've got our work cut out for us. So I'd certainly appreciate any additional comments that you might have, but as someone who has worked um, historically in this area of unfortunately family trauma, uh, I think we're all too aware of how often part and parcel uh, substance use disorders uh, are part of this. Thanks, and um, I will respond to that. And I, I wanna make one other comment about the data. There's always a possibility that Hawaii is recording things better than any other state. So if we have higher rates, it might mean that we're actually finding that and reporting it. In terms of what Dr. Giro was just talking about is the importance of substance use disorder treatment for families. Um, when you look across the spectrum of problems that bring children into contact with child welfare services, even though the number one reason isn't substance use disorders or isn't alcohol abuse, if you talk across the country to folks involved with the child welfare, welfare systems, they'll say 80 plus percent of the cases 
involve drugs or alcohol. Um, the official statistics are lower for the reasons that I just shared with you. But in terms of if you talk to a caseworker who goes out and works with families, what are they seeing? Um, it's substance use. And those are super difficult because if you work in that field, which I will admit I do not, but um, recovery takes a long time. It's not you apply a medical treatment and then someone's better and you maintain. It's a long process. And um, the individual's past life experience, particularly when trauma is involved, can complicate recovery. And um, you put that next to a child welfare system and a legal system that have timelines. Uh, the terminology is move a child to permanence. We don't want children growing up in foster care, which is an impermanent situation. We either want them home with parents, with relatives, or ideally adopted with others if the first two options don't work. Um, and so there's always a question of how long does a system work with parents to um, move them to, to help them get to the point where they're able to parent without using substances. And that is a, a difficult issue. The other thing is that children whose mothers, because primarily we know about what's happening with the mothers, whose mothers struggle with substance use disorder, that co-occurrence of child welfare involvement, allegations of maltreatment and substance use disorder, those are the most complicated cases and they're more likely to result in the negative outcomes for children. Uh, women who get involved with the child welfare system and have substance use disorders, um, generally speaking, have, uh, many complicated life factors. They usually have huge trauma histories, histories of abuse and violence in their own lives, um, oftentimes mental, co-occurring mental health disorders. And so when you put all of that together, um, it takes a long time to get that family able to be able to be together successfully. So getting treatment early, getting uh, trauma-informed treatment, gender specific treatment that understands the trauma that women coming in um, have endured. Those are three things that can really help to move children out of the system and back at home. Yeah, I'd also love to hear from uh, Candace, uh, certainly in her role, and I look at Salvation Army. Uh, I know there are a number of particular services that are needed uh, when family violence occurs. So we'd definitely love to hear Candace's thoughts. Yeah, well, we're, we're jumping right to my section already. I, I was trying to be quiet, Dr. Euro. <laughs> I know. Just tag teaming on, you know, family violence and what uh, Karen's been talking about. Yes. So I wanted you to chime yes. in because I know you're presenting on it, and yet it so ties in. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when you see that cycle, right, that we see. Uh, many of our pregnant parenting women that come in, there has been trauma very early on in their lives, right? We're talking about them also having been children in the child welfare services system and just how that trauma leads to finding ways to cope with all of that. And unfortunately, substances is one of those um, methods that they go to in order to avoid all of the pain, physical and emotional pain that they've experienced early on. Unfortunately, that particular um, method leads to more vulnerability, right? To more um, uh, behaviors and environments that put them again at further risk, that put them into uh, domestic violence situations as they start getting older. And that cycle and that pattern just continues on again, right? So when we talk about PPW programming, I'll say it just a quick moment. Um, you know, we're really looking at trying to shift that pattern that's beginning to happen and intervene so that the children no longer have that kind of uh, adverse childhood experience that can also lead further into um, more violence and more substance use. Right. Thank you to our panelists for this valuable discussion. We'll move on now actually to our Next uh, section, we don't have time for these other interesting questions that we've listed here, but maybe we'll just briefly uh, scroll through them. Questions about what the impact of COVID was, um, as well as whether the data reflects or differs from your experiences. Uh, Victoria, this is John. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I did have a question for Karen. Um, Karen, um, in your when you when you talked about the 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 current system. Um, uh, yeah, you one one of I believe your observations or recommendations was the need for 
more prevention sorts of services. And I think you mentioned something like, you know, child abuse, neglect, or intimate partner aggression and violence have devastating, obviously, personal, societal, economic costs, and how prevention can be a way to lower those costs. I mean, what, what sorts of, I'm curious, what's kind of types of, what sorts of prevention services, or uh, can you talk a little bit more about prevention mm -hmm. before we move on? Yeah, and this will actually also lead to Candace, and um, I'm sure she'll talk about specifically preventing substance use disorders. Um, but there's a wider range of family supports that are needed that help reduce the stressors that are leading parents to seek out coping mechanisms that might be unhealthy or that are using um, parenting methods or um, acting out in violence and anger towards their children and harming their children. So there's a lot of different things. And we have in this country an enormous research base of what works. Um, there seems to be a lack of will and a lack of funding to get that done. For example, we know early home visitation. Um, that is a program. There are many different varieties of it. And we do have it in Hawaii. It's federally funded under Title V, Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. So it's national. Um, but it only hits a limited number of families. So home visiting programs where uh, new mothers with specific risk factors. And so there's always that question of over surveillance. But so they're young, they're single, they're below a certain poverty level, um, they self identify for certain um, traumas in their histories. They get a person, a coach, to help them deal with this new infant that's coming into their lives. Um, we call them home visitors, but really they're parent coaches. Like, hey, you got this. You don't know how to do that here, let me help you. Um, so home visiting, uh, especially nurse partnership home visiting for the families highest at risk. Um, there's growing body of evidence about economic supports for family as prevention for child abuse and neglect. A majority of cases coming into systems, child welfare systems are for neglect. The two main causes of neglect, substance use disorder and poverty. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't have the stats, but if you talk to anyone in the system, those are just two things we see. So many, many families, they need financial supports. They don't need government surveillance, government intervention. They need a place to live. They need food. They need childcare. They need education. They need jobs. Um, I'm really not preaching. There's evidence behind that. Um, when ch children are in the child welfare system, to prevent these negative outcomes. There's a whole ton of research about this type of abuse puts, for example, adolescent girls at higher risk for alcohol abuse or at higher risk of being involved in a violent relationship later. We don't have enough of that research. What we've got is broad strokes, but we can better understand the pathways from specific types of parental actions to what's gonna to happen to the children later. So we've got the broad base of ACEs and there's a lot more specific things that can happen. So if we provide the right supports and services once children are known to systems, we can stop that generational cycle. And then I'm gonna let Candace talk more about the prevention on the substance use side. Thank you. And for, thank you for that question. That's really important. Thank you. These are all really wonderful discussions. And as always, we never have enough time to discuss. Uh, due to limitations in time, it is already 1137. We do have to move on to our next section. Um, and so we will move on now to chapter 12 on uh, substance use and pregnant and parenting women. So to start us off again, we have a poll. Um, how familiar are you with substance use issues affecting pregnant and parenting women in the state? So please take a moment to click the button and share with us your familiarity. Great, so this seems to be fairly well distributed across all three, not familiar, somewhat familiar, very familiar. And uh, we'll move on now to our next question here. Are you directly involved in providing services to pregnant and parenting women? Okay, thank you all for participating actively with your mouse. And again, it seems like the majority of you are not providing 
direct services. So thank you very much. That helps us understand who our audience is. Uh, before I pass it over to our um, next section, I, ju I just should just mention that there's a comment in the chat window by Ann Yabusaki regarding FASD and developmental disabilities and generational trauma that I invite you to, to read as well. Okay, next slide, please. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight these. Again, multiple sources of data across different subtopics. So we have information about substance use prevalence numbers from the NUSDA and the PRAMS. We have hospitalizations data from the HCUP and we have treatment data from the NUSDA, the WITS, and the TEDS. And again, in the interest of time, we won't have time to cover these, but invite you to our full report to knock yourself out with more information about details. Uh, next, please. Again, there are various limitations, um, including sample size issues and who is sampled and whether it's self-reported or not and the time frames and so on and so forth. Um, these are all important limitations, but again, in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next section. So I'll now pass this over to our uh, team member here, uh, Shelby McKee, who will be presenting the highlights from chapter 12. Thank you, Dr. Fan. Hi, everyone. My name is Shelby McKee. I am a research support staff for PHAC. Um, and so today I'm going to be giving an overview of the data that we have in chapter 12 of the 2022 statistical report, which covers substance use and pregnant and parenting women. The data presented in these next few graphs were extracted from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health and the Hawaii Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. This first graph presents past month's substance use among pregnant women for the state of Hawaii covering data from 2015 to 2018. This graph gives the total number of females aged 12 to 44 years who were pregnant at the time of the survey who drank alcohol, used tobacco, and used marijuana. Over the years 2015 to 2018, the number of women who drank alcohol was highest with 15.6%, followed by tobacco with 12.8 and marijuana being 2.1. Next slide, please. This graph shows the percentage of women by age group who drank alcohol three months before pregnancy over the years 2009 to 2015. In 2015, the percentage of women who drank alcohol three months before pregnancy was highest among women 25 to 34 years of age. And we can see that the group under 20 years of age had a major decline from 2009 to 2011 and stayed low compared to the other age groups. Next slide. So these graphs show the percent of women who drank alcohol three months before pregnancy and those who drank alcohol in the last three months of pregnancy by county in the year 2015. The graph on the left-hand side represents a percentage of women who drank alcohol three months before pregnancy with Kauai County having the highest percent of 61.2 and Hawaii County having the lower percentage of 52.6. The graph on the right-hand side represents the percentage of women who drank alcohol during the last three months of pregnancy, with Maui County having the highest percent of 11.5 and Honolulu County having the lowest of 7.8. Next slide. These graphs show the percentage of women who were binge drinking three months before pregnancy and also the percentage of women who used illicit drugs one month before pregnancy by county in the year 2015. The graph on the left-hand side shows the percentage of women who binge drink three months before pregnancy with Maui County having the highest percentage of 20.4 and Hawaii County having the lowest with 17.7. The graph on the right-hand side shows the percentage of women who use illicit drugs one month before pregnancy with Kauai County having the highest of 9.6 and Honolulu County having the lowest with 4.4. Next slide. This last graph looks at the percentage of women aged 12 to 44 years who needed and those who received treatment in the past year for illicit drug or alcohol use in the state of Hawaii by pregnancy status over the years 2015 to 2018. As you can see, the percentage of females aged 12 to 44 years in Hawaii who needed treatment for illicit drug or alcohol use is higher than the percentage of those who had received treatment. We can see that there is a little less than 7.5% of women aged 12 to 44 who are pregnant that needed treatment, 
and the percentage for received treatment among females who are pregnant at the time of this survey was actually suppressed. Um, now I will pass it back to Dr. Fan. So thank you. Thank you, Shelby. So now we're at the exciting and most fun part of this whole piece, which is the discussion portion of our presentation. We've got uh, roughly 10 minutes or so um, for discussion. And as we go through our questions, we invite you to share your feedback and comments as well to these discussion questions as well. So our first discussion question is, again, as our subject matter ex experts, we asked Candice, starting off, uh, what are some key highlights um, on substance use among pregnant and parenting women that you'd like to share with the audience? So over to Candice. Um, yes. Lots to share about highlights. Um, one of the first things you know to put out there is let's talk about why women who are pregnant and parenting um, want to seek treatment or why they come in to, to do those big life changes. And I'll tell you, it, it's relationships, right? It's all about trying to maintain or build um, a relationship. And for pregnant and parenting women, that strongest pull is really to continue to be there for their children. Right? What do we hear all the time when women are seeking treatment in substance use programs? It's things like, I don't wanna lose my child. I'm afraid to get help because they might take my baby away. Um, I don't know where to go. Um, I'd wanna be able to be in a place where I can also do treatment with my child. So you can see exactly the kind of motivation. Um, there's a lot of motivation to get help. Um, but they want to be able to do it in a way that's going to be safe and be able to maintain that relationship with their little one. Let's talk a little bit about the complexity of needs for pregnant and parenting women. I appreciated that Karen started the conversation about that because what we do see for women that are entering our treatment programs is a high number of them have co-occurring mental health disorders. Very commonly things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, which leads us to another very common area that our women are struggling with, and that is trauma. Again, um, briefly reflecting back to our conversation earlier about family violence, that uh, many of the women coming into treatment have unfortunately very early on experiences with trauma from childhood time. And just as we talked, right, about the cycle, about how that feeds into um, substance use, and then again, a vulnerability to experiencing more violence in their life. So a lot of complex needs there. On top of the fact there's a substance use disorder that we're dealing with. And then let's just add a child in there. <laughs> let's just add the complications of pregnancy, high-risk pregnancy into the mix. And you can just see um, what, we're, what we are um, needing to do to be able to provide to all of the things that, that they are dealing with and all of the potential barriers that pregnant parenting women face. And there are a lot of barriers for that. Um, there's limited programs that actually understand the full spectrum or the full continuum of services that are um, that we know is most successful for and that we see women being most successful at. But the services are at a continuum, you know, from home based services to outpatient services. Um, outpatient works really well if there's a safe home to be able to go back to. If there isn't a safe home, then are there therapeutic uh, supportive housing programs, clean and sober housing programs where you can bring your child with you? Um, are there, you know, what does the individual, does the mom need something even more structured? Do they need maybe a level of residential treatment where their little one is also able to come into treatment and receive info mental health services at the same time? So you can see just that there's a whole variety of continuum of services um, that would be needed because it's because of the complexity of the women and what they are having to manage. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of programs that are out there that are able to do that. You know, when I was looking at the slides and I noticed that Kauai um, was one of those very dark colors on there, meaning like uh, there was a high percentage of folks. I think it was, it was it under drinking. I can't remember the specific. Um, but when I look at some of the ADAD contracted uh, providers there, there, I did not see any therapeutic supportive housing or um, clean and sober housing where you could bring your child with you into treatment. And I wonder if that would have made a difference, right, for some of the ladies. One of the only residential treatment programs that we have um, in the state where you could bring your child with you and your child receive treatment at the same time is located on Oahu, right? That's our Salvation Army Women's Way program. 
And yet women will travel from the neighbor islands to be able to sustain that relationship with their child, to be able to get health and treatment, um, and that they're willing to move to a different island. I mean, that says something, right? Um, so definitely the barriers for our rural population of pregnant and parenting women, you know, being able to have a variety of continuum of services within their community um, is what's missing out there and what makes it very hard for women to be able to finally get to the treatment, again, that they want, but needs to be at a, a level um, uh, that includes their children and that includes their family and their partners too. So um, I think the last thing I want to talk about for highlights was just about the stigma, that stigma is still uh, real for pregnant and parenting women. And um, just being able to come into treatment and get good medical care for OBGYN care, for example, um, there's a lot of fear about doing that um, and being punished if they are still struggling with a substance use disorder. So um, yeah, I just wanted to leave it with that, you know, that, um, Children need to be a part of the treatment process. That's what PPW um, treatment is about. It's not just about the woman, it's really inclusive of the whole family. And when that last question was talking about prevention, I think about when you can do good PPW work in an SUD program, you're doing an intervention, but you're also doing prevention at the same time, right? So, okay, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. Thank you so much, Candice. We're reinforcing the many overlapping risk factors and the continuum from even before birth, you know, through childhood and through through adulthood and uh, the neighbor islands and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll move on now to our next question here um, and open it up to our panel. Um, how has COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacted substance use and substance use service delivery among pregnant and parenting women in the state. And uh, maybe we'll also start with Candice and if Karen or others have other comments, we'd welcome your, you to chime in. Yeah, so just hopping off of what we were just talking about, um, having limited uh, full PPW services to begin with. So when COVID hit, obviously that challenged that, that small little population, that small little service population even more so. Um, like in many other residential level treatment programs, for example, we had to watch out about keeping beds. We had to lower census, right? Because we needed to keep some beds open for quarantine or if people became sick and so forth. Um, so definitely that was a, a very initial impact. Some of the other things that we saw happening early on um, were that women with children in particular we're not necessarily wanting to come into a residential level treatment or a community housing level of treatment uh, out of fear, right? Of exposing their children to more communal living. Um, but also there were just, um, you know, we had neighbor island travel restrictions. So again, if you were traveling, trying to bring your children together, you had that barrier. There were also disruptions in coordinating with their caseworkers to reunite with their children. So early on in the, in the pandemic, we were not seeing a lot of moms with children coming into treatment. And now we are, now we're flourishing again. We have many pregnant women coming in wanting help. And we also have a lot of new babies coming. Um, the last two things that we were really impacted by COVID um, was the intensity of the mental health needs of the women coming into our treatment program. We're very accustomed to co-occurring mental health disorders like depression and anxiety, but we are seeing women come in that are so unstable um, that there is no grasp on reality. And you need to at least have that in order to have any kind of a meaningful participation in a substance use treatment program, right? So we're just seeing more of that happening in our program. More women are leaving against medical advice. More women are um, having to be discharged, unfortunately, because they're unsafe to the rest of the community of, of, of children and of, of moms. And then the other huge impact of COVID that we're gonna be continuing to experience is just the increasing costs of providing any level of care. Um, you know, we talked about all the, the variety of needs for, for pregnant and parenting women and their children. And just think of the cost of all of that, uh, transportation, gasoline prices, transport transporting women to doctor appointments, for example, all the way up to the increasing costs of being able to attract and retain um, good employees, good clinicians to be able to work and have the skill to work with pregnant and parenting women. Um, so yeah, we're not a cod of COVID yet. We're still feeling it. And our women are certainly feeling that. Yeah. 
Thank you, Candice. Are there other comments from our panelists on this question or from our audience, if you have anything you'd like to share about this question? If not, we'll move on to our next question now. And um, it's question seven, how does the data presented in the report re reflect or differ from what you've experienced while providing services? And um, we'll open this up to, to Candice or, or Karen or anyone really, and even, even our audience members as well. I could start with just um, a comment. Um, but, you know, obviously there's some gaps in our data collection, right? Um, so that's an area that we obviously have to take a little bit closer look. I know as a provider, we collect a lot of data looking at outcomes. We look at demographics. We look at all of those kinds of things because that informs us on the kind of programming effectiveness we have. And we want to make sure we're doing the best for our clients and that we're always improving our services. Um, so when I saw some of the data sets, I thought, well, there's a lot of um, missing information on there. And even as we are writing um, part of that chapter on PPW and substance use, we were having a difficult time trying to get that information, even from some of our own systems. Um, we've been working with ADAD, right, on trying to um, pull the data specific to PPW. And it's been a struggle, you know, and, and yet there is a system out there where, you know, the potential, that opportunity is there um, for us to be able to really make some good use of all of the wealth of information that is going into the WIT system. And for any providers out there who use WITS, I know it's a love-hate relationship. However, <laughs> there is a lot of data. Um, and if it could be used in a way that is you know, easily accessible, that's meaningful, um, you're gonna find providers maybe more willing to be able to participate in that as a data collection point, um, especially if we can get some of that information back too. Because like I said, data-driven program, quality improvement, um, we, we believe in it. Um, but it needs to be in a system that is, uh, again, easy to use because there's already a the system is being taxed as it is energy wise. So it has to be really an easy um, 